Hello, everybody. This is Paul Sims speaking to you from Eiffel Pharma in London. Uh, well done. You're here on time. Thanks so much for being here uh, promptly. Um, we're just going to wait, however, one more minute because I can see a lot of people are still joining. So just going to wait one more minute to make sure no one uh, gets cut off, and then we will go straight into the webinar after that. So don't go anywhere. Be back with you in a moment. Hello, this is Paul Sims again, uh, Chairman at IFA Pharma. Welcome, everybody. Welcome uh, from me and uh, to today's webinar, which is called, as you can hopefully see in front of you, Drive Launch Success. Uh, and it comes with a snappy tagline underneath, um, which is going to appear in just one second. Um, less is more with the right channel mix. Uh, this has been a pretty popular topic, actually. We've got more than 700 people signed up. Uh, and uh, really, um, perhaps I don't need to say why this is a, a motivating topic. I think it's possibly quite obvious to, to many of us. Um, but what might not be obvious is uh, some of the reasons why launch success is becoming ever more difficult, ever more competitive, ever more important. Uh, I mean, we all are familiar, of course, with the fact that uh, today's commercial environment is increasingly competitive. Um, but uh, the reality is that success is focused on a smaller number of therapy areas, on more often than not specialty medicines now, uh, with more companies effectively chasing fewer prescribers and payers. So uh, couple that with the, the various pressures we also have on margins uh, and in finding those improvements in launch performance without actually increasing costs. And we've got a, a definite rise in temperature, I think you could say. Um, you've also really just got one chance, one chance to impress your customers. Um, and really um, the preparation, the understanding and the flexibility that you then have to have a best in class commercial model is becoming very much the minimum requirement. So a minimum requirement meaning, of course, fully integrated, orchestrated, multi-channel approach and determining which channels to prioritize as well as just the basic messaging, absolutely critical. So we're going to be uh, talking about some very interesting things today. We're going to be talking about some uh, of the latest findings from IQVIA on uh, some study in this area. We're going to be looking at some of the barriers that uh, people have encountered and how they've been obviated. Uh, we're going to review some of the key needs for implementing multi-channel, including the appropriate content and channel mix that's actually required going forward. And as you can hopefully imagine, I have been joined by some people far smarter than I am, as you can hopefully see from your screen right now. We've got four smiling faces who are going to be joining me today in this conversation. So firstly, top left, we have Deborah. Deb is uh, the Senior Director of Marketing and Multi-Channel Team Leader at Lilly, um, based in the US, of course. Uh, she actually worked as a pediatrician for, 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 um, before joining Lilly, where she's been for 19 years now, uh, and she's got a, a huge wealth of experience when it comes to marketing roles, both at the US affiliates and in global brand development, uh, and has really been at the front end developing and executing strategy across a range of therapeutic areas. Um, she's also a keen volleyball fan. She goes to the Green Bay Packers games and spends a lot of time with family and friends. Thank you so much, Deborah. Really appreciate you being here. Um, just under Deborah, we've got Paul. Uh, Paul um, has over 30 years of pharma experience and has become a good friend of ours at Ive Pharma recently, uh, most, uh, most recently actually in his role at GSK. But as you can see, he's recently joined Novartis UK as a digital lead there. He's also got experience at companies like Welcome Boots, BSF, BASF, AstraZeneca, and MSD. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he's, he's got a, a, a huge uh, wealth of experience that we're going to enjoy today, both uh, in uh, Europe, Africa, the USA, and Japan. He's also a keen rugby and cricket fan. We've got quite a lot of uh, sports competency on today's uh, uh, panel, although he admits he now plays more from his armchair than in real life. 
Um, and I believe he knows how to say cheers in 11 languages, which uh, I think shows uh, some kind of ability. I'm not entirely sure what, but uh, Paul, you'll regale us with that later, no doubt. Um, now, on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see we have two panelists from IQVIA. And there's a reason for that, and that's because IQVIA have been uh, very much at the forefront of putting today's session together. Uh, and indeed, we're going to hear from, from uh, Sarah and uh, Alexandra very shortly uh, to, to hear some of their latest findings. But uh, yeah, IQVIA have been a, a really solid partner in actually putting today's event together. And indeed, it wouldn't be here. Uh, we wouldn't be doing this without them. So uh, even before we've, we've got into it, I, I owe them a huge debt of gratitude for that. So Sarah in your top left, um, she's actually the vice president uh, and works in the thought leadership. So lots of interesting conversations can be had with Sarah, that's for sure. Um, she, uh, she's been doing a, a great deal of work on this very topic and she's been working in pharma for 26 years now, starting actually at Accenture's pharmaceutical strategic practice before joining IMS Health, now IQ here of course, uh, and uh, is, uh, been been focusing in that area now for eight years. She enjoys surveying butterflies in Richmond Park, which uh, I think I need to ask her more about, to be honest. Uh, and uh, it's her birthday tomorrow, so uh, maybe we'll sing to you, Sarah. No, don't worry, we won't. Um, but uh, happy birthday tomorrow. Uh, and then Alexandra, um, last but not least, is a consultant working with Sarah in the European Thought Leadership Team at IQVIA. has been working with the team since 2015. Um, and uh, uh, prior to IQVIA was actually studying a master's in biochemistry and a PhD in developmental biology from Oxford University. So is clearly the smartest of the bunch and I uh, look forward to hearing from, from you later, Alexandra. Uh, she's also a keen climber. Bouldering, I believe, is the uh, way forward and enjoys Bake Off. So maybe we'll see her on a TV program sometime soon. So thank you so much to all of you. Um, I'm now going to actually hand over to Sarah who's going to uh, take the next step of the conversation from us. But before I do, I just want to make sure that you are all familiar with the right-hand side of your screen where you will see a questions box. Uh, and in fact, just to make sure you haven't fallen asleep uh, already, could you just write a quick hello in that questions box for me? And then I know that you uh, have found it. Oh, there we go, getting lots of hellos in. So now that you uh, have familiarized yourself with its location, I would love for you to use this um, actively throughout the conversation today. In fact, I hope that everybody can uh, at least ask one or two questions uh, over the course of the, of the hour. Um, this is really the only way to make sure that we get your questions answered. So uh, do, um, do write in and we will make sure that our panel address those very questions. Okay, let me hand over to Sarah now. Sarah, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul, and um, let's have the next slide. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Paul's um, introduced me so well, I um, don't need to cover any more ground from that perspective. But what I would like to introduce um, is um, our new white paper on driving launch success and um, this um, assertion, which might sound almost counterintuitive below, which is less can be more in the right channel mix. Um, and we'll tell you why when we take you through in the next 10 minutes um, just the um, key findings of a piece of work we've done which was very quantitatively driven over the um, top seven uh, markets that really matter um, for um, innovative protected um, launch um, using our channel dynamics and our Midas um, sales data. So let's turn um, to the next slide now and dive into those um, findings. Paul's already set the scene for some of this, but um, I'll reiterate. Um, we are in a situation um, where companies need launch success more than ever, um, but they um, cannot achieve that launch success at um, any price. Commercial models have to be uh, more impactful um, and more um, effective. There's really a three-way problem in this um, sense. Um, we are seeing um, an increasing um, number of um, launches um, and companies have to be able to be consistently successful across those launches. Naturally, history tells us that even the best companies in the world, the biggest companies in the world, are not good at consistent launch success, either across launches or with the same launch across um, countries. Now, increasingly, they will have to do that without significantly growing um, their promotional budgets. Selling general and administrative lines for most companies 
um, are squeezed right now uh, because what we are seeing is a three to one problem. Uh, research and development costs have been growing, uh, have grown about threefold in the last um, decade and a half. Whereas in the same time, the pharmaceutical market's overall revenues have probably only um, doubled. Um, and in that same time period, the um, return from individual launches has grown slightly, but um, less than um, less than one and a half um, fold. Um, and what this means is that other parts of the budget uh, are under pressure, um, and that immediately means that MSGNA um, is under pressure. At the same time, the nature of the launches have changed. We've got more complex, um, often specialty launches um, in increasingly competitive environments. And this inevitably has led um, to a focus on solutions that are about mature multi-channel promotion, which is about full spectrum multi-channel, a broad range of channels, and a fully integrated customer facing team that is fully orchestrated as well. So knowing this, we set out to answer the question, do the most commercially successful launches actually have a different type of channel mix? Can I de demonstrate that using our um, audit information? And if we go to the next slide, Alexandra is going to take you through what we did and the key findings of the white paper there before we go into the general discussion. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Yes, so the key question we wanted to ask, answer, as Sarah's just said, was were, was the channel mix for those successful launches any different? So what we started by doing was obviously we needed to define which those most commercially successful launches were. And we focused our analysis on the top seven developed markets. So that's the US, Japan, and the top five European markets. And the reason for this was that actually those markets uh, we know from analysis, contribute up to 90% of first year sales for launches of new active substances. So really the key market when it comes to launch. And we focused on the launches of new active substances in a five year window between 2012 and 2017. And that actually constituted 755 individual launches that we considered. We then classified those in terms of uh, their commercial success based on um, their ranking in terms of absolute sales for the first four quarters following launch. And we then were able to assign launches as being international top sellers versus all others. What we then wanted to do was see, as Sarah said, were those international top sellers doing something different when it came to the promotional mix? So the next thing we had to do was look at how um, those launches had gone from a promotional perspective. And to do that, we used our channel dynamics promotional audit data. And we compared the successful launches to the others based on four key metrics of multi-channel. Obviously, multi-channel is impossible without use of digital contacts. So a key metric for us was the volume of digital contacts that had been used throughout the first year following launch. We're also interested to know how the profile of that digital activity looked. And we'll talk about this more in the later slides, but a key question comes up about whether um, a launch involves a burst of digital activity in the first quarter, perhaps following launch, and then trails off, or whether that approach should be more sustained. When it comes to qualitative measures of multi-channel, we also wanted to look at the richness of the channel mix. So we focused our analysis on five key digital channels, which we measure in volume terms in channel dynamics. And those are email, live e-details and automated e-details, and then live and automated e-meetings. And we wanted to assess whether the most successful launches had used a broader range of channels. And finally, we also wanted to see how those digital engagements had been perceived by the doctors themselves and how they scored those contacts. Um, and finally, what we found, uh, what came out of this analysis was that actually at a very top line level, yes, those internationally uh, successful launches did use a higher volume of um, digital contacts and that was usually more sustained. 
Uh, they were also supported by a broader range of digital channels. And although the detail can be more complex, um, I'll take you through uh, those findings in a bit more detail now. So if we can move on to the next slide. So on that first point regarding the higher share of digital volume, what we found was, in fact, the international top-selling launches had a higher share of digital contacts throughout the first year following launch, consistently across all four quarters, and in all seven of the markets that we looked at. So this was um, consistent everywhere we looked, and those successful launches truly did have a higher share of uh, digital contacts. Really supporting this idea then that those successful launches had had a more committed approach when it came to their digital engagement. Moving on to the next slide then, the point about uh, the profile of that activity and whether that activity was sustained or whether we had a strong blitz in the first quarter. Well, again, as I said, the majority of those international top sellers did tend to have a more sustained approach, as you'll see on that chart there. Again, supporting the idea they had, um, they were committed to that conviction that digital was going to um, improve that performance. And finally, the last finding around the richness of digital mix on the next slide, um, where we saw that again, uh, when we classified launches as being uh, rich in terms of the channel mix, so using three or more of those five channels, we saw that the international top sellers did tend to be richer in the use of digital channels. So I'm going to over to Sarah now, who will um, take you through the last slide and um, look at a few of the other things we considered when... Thank you very much, Alexandra. So um, I think that the data is... Um, extremely interesting because it was across um, hundreds of launches, seven countries that account for the vast majority of these launches' commercial return, um, and obviously on the basis of um, hundreds of thousands of contacts made with um, tens of thousands of doctors across those um, markets. Um, and um, we feel we have um, quite a strong um, conclusion here um, as a result. But there were some other things that I think are important to um, note from this study. Um, first off, the most commercially successful launches were all what IQVIA would classify as specialty launches, launches for oncology, um, for autoimmune diseases, in some cases rare diseases and other um, products that are uh, prescribed by specialists for um, complex and serious conditions. Now, partly that is because that is what is being launched um, in most cases at the moment. Many of the launches coming to market are um, specialty. It's also a reflection of where the value growth in these markets is at the moment. Um, it is being driven very strongly um, by specialty, although, of course, there are important primary care launches um, too. Specialty launches tend to be focused on smaller numbers of doctors. Naturally, our specialty launches as a whole had a lower promotional spend than the primary care launches that were happening. And this is a reflection of the costs um, of doing business going to market um, to um, um, a product that is um, going to need to be marketed to um, tens or hundreds of thousands of doctors versus perhaps a few thousands or even a few hundreds on the specialty side. International top sellers, which were all specialties, we said actually had a higher promotional investment than the rest of the specialty launches. So in that sense, um, money is still um, important. But overall, um, in specialty, you can spend less. Um, and, um, and get more. From a digital perspective, the international top sponsors did have a higher share of digital contacts, and it was also, as Lexi said, more sustained. And that we see as a marker of multi-channel maturity. Um, it is not um, just a one-time option at the beginning of the launch. It's something that is um, completely integrated within the marketing mix um, throughout. And um, that leads to that quality engagement, something that is a richer and more sophisticated customer experience um, that helps support a better healthcare professional perception and engagement. So that's the end of our findings. If we just move um, to the next slide, if you have any questions about this that um, you don't want to bring up in the next few minutes as we um, go to the panel discussion, here are our contacts. And then one last 
slide, if I may, before we go into the panel discussion. Um, if you're on this um, particular webinar, then that means you aren't on this other webinar, which is happening simultaneously. Um, if um, research and development and clinical trials are also your interest, please note this webinar, which you can um, download afterwards if you want a double dose of IQVIA. Anyway, I'll stop there and hand back to Paul. And who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to double dose? Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, in fact, I'd say we have a double dose with, with both of you here already. I um, really appreciate that. We've already got um, some, some questions uh, coming in. Uh, so if it's all right with you, I think we'll just stay with you a little bit longer so that we can just cover a couple of, um, couple of these. Um, Mark Fisher says, was there any assessment of the, the data between the current share of voice and the launch brand considered? Uh, I think we need to recognize that the launch is not just share of voice or messaging, but also resonance and need. Uh, hopefully you can understand what, what Mark is, is, is saying there, yeah, but it's definitely a comparison between uh, old and new that, that we also are looking for. Um, Kurti Jindal um, asks a more practical point, which, which key KPIs help determine uh, whether the launch is actually successful or not? And do they vary across the life cycle as to where the greatest impact might be? Um, Trish Monaco asks uh, whether or not you can further define the digital channels. I heard you define a few of those, uh, Alexandra, but maybe you can, you can, you can answer that question anyway. Uh, what exactly you mean by uh, all of the digital channels and maybe an example? Uh, and, uh, they, and oh, let's first, just have the, three because I think I think I can only hold three okay. um, questions. Oh no, that's fine. That's fine. I was going to give you a choice. One has to give you a choice. Um, <laughs> All right, go so for maybe it. if we deal with the um, the the questions about methodology first, and then come back to that first yeah, and very sure. interesting questions about content. And um, Alexandra, do you just want to run over what the digital channels were quickly again? Yeah. So like I said, email, which um. Are, think doesn't need any more qualification and then uh, live and automated e-details so a live e-detail would be with a rep um, over Skype for instance uh, showing content over the internet whereas an um, automated e-detail would be um, driven by the doctor online clicking through um, some content themselves whereas then the live and automated e-meetings so an e live e-meeting again would be uh, perhaps something like uh, this webinar where you have people dialing in and uh, listening live to some content and discussing whereas uh, automated uh, would tend to be more streaming videos and then the second question we had was how do we define the kpi for launch um, success again this was pretty simple in this case we were just looking for absolute levels of commercial success in terms of sales within a country and relative to other launches um, at the time um exactly so we just looked um we, uh, for each quarter following launch um we took launches that were consistently in the top quartile of all launches throughout all four quarters following launch. And that defines success in an individual country. And then meeting that criteria in two or more of those seven countries made a launch internationally successful. Can I just interrupt there? Because there's a slight nuance in that question. It was actually which uh, key KPIs help determine whether launch could be successful. So I guess uh, the, the questioner is asking you whether or not you've got any anything to say on, on what what forms of measurement actually appear to draw, move the needle most of all, if that's okay. So, well, the whole area of KPIs, I think, could be a whole webinar um, in and of itself. Um, <laughs> Certainly could. Um, I think that, um, you know, in this case, we were looking at the relationship between um, promotional investment, and in that sense, one of the key performance indicators we were looking at was share of uh, digital activity in relation to um, measures of um, commercial success, if that was our other KPI, where it was, um, as Lexi said, about um, absolute performance, sales performance in a given um, country. So, you know, we, we believe um, that we have shown that um, digital plays um, a, a role um, in, in the success of the um, um, best-selling um, products. Um, there are more sophisticated KPIs, absolutely, that you can use, and that would be the subject of further um, research. And um, maybe it also goes to the um, the first question, um, which um, 
um, as I understand it, was um, a very important point about the fact that it's not just about share of voice or absolute levels of activity, um, but also the nature of the content um, that um, is um, being um, shared with um, healthcare professionals um, and the degree to which that um, is of good quality and engaging as well. Mm. The questioner, Mark, has just uh, written a, a, a further clarification, said, uh, to, just to confirm, that's the difference between the standard of care between the that, that the launch brand is, is replacing, i.e. increase in efficacy, overall survival. So I guess that's actually to do with the, the medicine itself. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and very briefly on that, because I feel like I'm eating into um, Paul and Deborah's time. <laughs> um, you know, we have looked in other studies at the degree to which um, launch products differentiated with what exists on the market um, and the degree of unmet need in the um, that exists in the um, disease area um, and the relation to um, launch success. Absolutely, um, if you have high unmet need and um, high levels of um, differentiation, a greater proportion of launches will be commercially successful. But it is possible to have commercially successful launches in all four quadrants if you um, make a matrix um, out of this. Um, and sometimes the um, difference is about the um, quality um, of the um, commercial engagement um, with healthcare professionals um, as well. Okay, uh, so we've had a flurry of new questions, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll open, we'll move on to the next section of the webinar for the moment, and then hopefully we'll have time to come back to those later, keep them coming in, because I'll certainly be pausing the conversation as we go. Um, but I do want to uh, bring uh, Paul and Deborah into into the conversation. Um, Paul and Deborah, do you have any anything that you want to comment on uh, in terms of what's been said already, um, or before we go to, to the first audience question? So, so over to you. Hi, Paul. It's no, I don't. Oh. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. Um, I just wanted to come in. Uh, thanks, uh, Deborah. I just want to come in on the uh, two points there. One is uh, the point seven made about content. Um, this this white paper looks at the mix of channels, uh, but the channels are really empty vessels unless you put some really good engaging content in there. So I think one when one looks at the mix uh, driving the launch success, one has to look both at the optimum mix of channels, but also the right, and it's, it sounds obvious, but sometimes uh, we don't do it, um, the right mix of that content that's really going to engage our customers into that. We really do need a good understanding of the customers, um, what they're trying to do, what their pains and their gains are, um, as well as their preference for, for particular channels. Uh, I also wanted to come back on the point of, of what the lead or, or what the KPIs are before we get to the the, uh, the output measures, which are the sales. And I think you, when you've gone through the various channels here of emails and uh, the details, remote or uh, um, assisted, you can look at some of the lead measures there. So, so what are we getting in terms of, of opens of emails? What do we get in terms of click through? What engagement are we getting with the content there? Um, duration of time spent on um, the e-details, the number of people who are returning to engage with subsequent emails, subsequent, subsequent um, details, subsequent um, meetings, I think are all lead indicators of whether we're going to achieve the sales that are targeted for. Yeah, and I'll just build on that, Paul, um, from the standpoint, uh, the content, you're absolutely right, that needs to be you have to have relevant content and it needs to be meaningful, then figure out what channels it needs to be in. And I think you hit on something really uh, really important. You need to understand your customer, which means you actually have to segment your customers. And once you segment your customers, then you can understand what their tensions and frustrations are or where they are in the journey and then tailor the content accordingly. So I think one area pharma needs to move away from is a one-size-fits-all messaging where we feel like we everybody needs to know exactly our efficacy and exactly our safety and exactly how to set patient expectations. That's all fine and good, but the way in which you deliver that content needs to be tailored so that it is meaningful to the customer. And then on the KPI, I would build on your comments, um, Paul, in terms of, yes, 
we absolutely need to look at leading and lagging um, measurements, and measurement is a key area we need to improve as an industry. And I think one key place is um, we spend a lot of time measuring channel and just how the channel is performing, but we actually need to move and pivot towards measuring how is the customer engagement. So looking at a customer ROI versus a channel ROI and actually measuring content and consumption of that content. Because once we understand that, that's the golden thread to see how they are advancing in the um, buyer spectrum and understanding our different brands. Thank you, Deb. Well, the uh, IQVIA white paper does cover that very issue quite quite well, talking about the various uh, different uh, NPS scores that, that different uh, attempts are, uh, uh, are getting. So I would encourage everyone to have a look at that. But actually, you've also uh, led very nicely into my first question to the audience, which is exactly on this point. So if you look at your screen now, you should see a question appear. How does your company determine the priority channels for launch uh, and actually the middle one of these is is what we've just been talking about the suitability of challenge to the type of message being conveyed which is what both Paul and Deb just mentioned but also there's some other options and I'm being very mean here in forcing you to choose only one what is realistically um, within your company the thing that actually matters most here is it a company-wide policy on moving in a general direction maybe the company is trying to be more digital or trying to be a certain something um, historically what worked and what didn't so you're you're really focusing on previous metrics and, and historical uh, launches to to determine uh, what works best and uh, some would say that's the data-driven approach and therefore the right approach uh, the, as we've just said, the suitability of channel to the type of message or the type of theme that you want to convey. Uh, is it experience or capabilities in-house towards certain challenges? Is your company specifically well geared to do forms of uh, launch in certain channels? Uh, finally, is there a general move, very difficult to say because you might have a general move towards an educational or a non-promotional spend within your company uh, and indeed that's, that's the way forward for you. So um, there could probably be five more options. I was limited to five maximum, so I apologize if your favorite isn't even on here. Um, but uh, I can see that about 40% of you have voted already. So I'm going to hold that open for five more seconds and hopefully get the rest of you to vote. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, thank you so much to everybody who did vote there. Let's have a look at the results. Okay, so we have uh, something in everything, but we definitely have, uh, well, I don't know if it's your incredible influence, Deb and Paul, but uh, I imagine it's reality. Nearly half of people have chosen the suitability of channel option, um, but uh, significant minorities for the others, nearly a third of people choosing what historically worked and what didn't. And I know I was particularly keen on forcing you to choose one here. I'm sure that you would have ticked every box if you could. Um, but this is an interesting uh, result, I think, in terms of the polarity. Um, so back to Sarah and Alexandra. Do you have any comments on this based on your uh, previous findings? I think this is incredibly encouraging uh, because um, that, that's really the way that uh, multi-channels should be. It's a um, box of tools and um, you want to make sure um, that you're using um, the um, tools to, to orchestrate your message and um, your story in, in the best way. Clearly, um, a simple mass market um, email um, in no way um, tells the whole story um, of a um, product um, and um, its benefits and um, so on and so forth. Um, but it can be um, an absolutely um, perfect um, tool for opening. Um, the conversation and taking um, a healthcare professional on a um, journey. Um, and um, equally, um, there may well be um, questions that a healthcare professional feels um, happy to um, talk to a rep about face-to-face um, -face, um, that perhaps they wouldn't um, um, have with, um, with, a, with a mass um, webinar. Um, and we know that healthcare professionals, because they are busy people, um, want to be able to um, choose um, the ways that they can get the information they need um, from pharmaceutical companies that um, fit with their schedules and their lives, which is why um, multi-channel is a boon. It offers options um, in terms of when you can engage, when you can get information, um, when, this, um, when, when you choose to um, 
have um, a situation where really all you want to do is get information and get it as efficiently as possible, as opposed to when there is um, the possibility of a more um, social interaction and a social um, engagement. And research we've done has shown that um, healthcare professionals um, value digital forms of engagement, sometimes because they feel it's um, about information uh, much more than it is about social engagement, and therefore they're getting what they need as an essential rapidly. Okay. Anything more? Alexandra, do you want to add on top of that? Or? No, not for me. Okay, lovely. Um, uh, we can talk oh. about this uh, a bit more. Yes, yeah, sorry, go for it, Paul. Uh, I'm going yeah, gonna, to gonna let you answer this and then slide. move on. Yeah. Okay. Just copy, if you can go back to that slide. I'm just interested um, in a couple of answers. You there. mean the, the results? There you go. That's it, yeah. Um, I like I like the answer historically what worked and what didn't. Um, to me, that suggests that people are learning rather than just reinventing it each time. So that, that's good, as long as we don't exclude the, the possibility of trying new channels. Um, just uh, but The other thing I'm really interested in, having worked for companies who've invested an awful lot of money, time and effort and resources in sort of core channels and competencies within the organisations that are at regional and global level, uh, the low number, 11%, uh, use of experience or capabilities in-house to all certain channels. I wonder whether, Deb, you've got any comments on that? Absolutely. So um, I think that his, I'm encouraged by the low number there. That makes me um, feel like we are we're learning, which is, if you prioritize where your competency is and where your expertise is, then you have forsaken the customer. And so it is incredibly important to first and foremost understand where is the customer looking to get information and what um, what places are the most, so combined with the content that we just talked about, but then what channels are within their workflow that are important to them to receive information. And so that doesn't always line up with where we have decided to build capabilities and expertise. And so I'm encouraged because it suggests that we're putting the customer first and what is the relevant channels to them within their workflow and not putting ourselves first. Okay, thank you. Um, what I'm going to do actually is move on to another question just because I feel like uh, this one flows nicely so we should go straight, straight forward. Um, Sarah, you mentioned uh, in your reply a second ago that uh, digital spend is um, proving to, uh, in general, to, to, to be more effective, um, particularly when it comes to sustaining of it. And I'm just quite keen to see whether or not our audience uh, is actually uh, making this happen or able to make it happen. So my question is now, how receptive is your company generally towards that increase in digital spend? This is on the assumption that um, you agree with what uh, Sarah has just said and that this is something that you wish to do. So is it extremely re receptive? You, are, you consider yourselves a digital first company, you prioritize innovation and things you haven't necessarily tried before. And I, and I want to uh, mention as well, obviously, this is all prioritizing uh, exactly what uh, Deb and Paul just talked about, i.e. what the customer wants uh, first. But um, extremely or very, we are trying to increase, but carefully, perhaps in, in a more measured uh, approach and, a, and, a, and a see, what, see, where, see where others uh, and see what else has worked before uh, way. Uh, somewhat, there's a slight tendency, not very. We actually prefer the traditional channels uh, or finally, hard to say, spend is very varied across different launches or perhaps is moving, like I said in the last question, towards non-promotional type of activities uh, that don't necessarily involve digital at all. So um, five different options, once again, being mean and forcing you to choose only one. Uh, I can see that uh, clearly the alert 40% of you have voted already again, so I shall hold it open for, for, for the rest. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you so much to everybody who got their votes in towards the end there. Um, let's have a look at the results. Okay, so it's definitely a, a nudge towards the top, isn't it? Um, but we uh, we are seeing uh, it's not uh, it's not sort of throw the, the kitchen sink at it. It's uh, very much in in that area. So, are you encouraged by that? So, I mean, obviously you they they, they didn't see your results before pre uh, previously, but are you encouraged by that general movement? 
I, I think it's what I would um, expect. We've done a lot of work on the um, different levels of multi-channel maturity um, across countries. So the first thing I'd say is um, um, absolutely country, companies are um, multinational um, entities, but different countries that they operate in um, have different um, promotional environments and different cultures and expectations as far as healthcare professionals are concerned and um, frankly different levels of multi-channel uh, maturity. Um, digital is um, not the only indicator of multi-channel maturity by any means but um, levels of digital activity are far higher in Japan and the US um, than they are for some big European countries, and Europe in itself has a great deal of diversity um, in that respect. So um, in, in that um, context, I think um, it would be surprising if um, an international pharmaceutical company um, were, you know, 100% uh, at the digital um, leading um, edge, because the starting point in the countries they operate in is going to be um, different. So. Uh, but the general direction of movement across countries, regardless of where they are now, is towards an increasing use of digital. Um, and I'm absolutely certain that as our health care professionals become majority millennial, uh, which they will over the next decade, um, that will absolutely um, accelerate as well. Um, but in the end, um, each company wants to ensure that they've got a balance. This is a set of tools. Um, you use them um, with the right tool for the right occasion um, and the right um, doctor. Um, and that is going to mean that people um, will take care because they should take care because they should be thinking carefully about the quality of the mix and the experience um, that their healthcare professionals customers have. I'll jump in a little bit on that too, Paul. Um, building a little bit on what Sarah said, which is you know, it's a journey, and at Lilly, we are still probably predominantly traditional focused on Salesforce and peer-to-peer -peer and Congresses, the traditional channels that we've normally turned to when we launch. But we made a commitment to put the customer first um, in, our, in our customer 2020 vision. And when we did that, we said, where's the customer going to get the information? And that forced us to then start thinking digital as well and how do we engage them in the digital space. In a recent launch that we did, um, we took a very strong digital footprint combined with the traditional footprint. And what we were able to find is that even at launch, over 60% of our healthcare provider engagements actually came outside of the traditional channels and came from those digital channels. And then when we calculated the ROI and showed how positive it was, that got the momentum for the rest of the organization to say, hey, maybe maybe we need to think about this differently. So I don't think it's an all or none. I don't think it's all personal and traditional versus all digital. It's that right combination and mix, as we've been talking about, that is focused on the customer that will yield the best um, performance, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think it's the customer so this, sorry, just for just one point to build on um, Deborah's point. I think that the nature of the customer-facing team is changing as well because the reps themselves are now more digitally enabled. They um, often see themselves as being, um, um, you know, part of a web of interactions which could include um, digital interactions. You know, a email that is from a rep the doctor knows is um, a different type of email to a mass email. Um, so our traditional tools. Um, are being changed by digital too. Um, something that we talked about when we were preparing for this session, but we haven't talked about yet, is the um, ability for, of course, digital to not be. Uh, we've already well, we've already talked about how it's not a one one size fits all, but we haven't also talked about how digital technology allows you to vary your campaign uh, throughout uh, the phases, and of course. Um, the, the trendy buzzwords at the moment are all around agility uh, and, and uh, being lean and obviously being much more iterative in our approaches. Uh, and one of the things that came to bear was about how um, we're often reliant on good data in order to make the decisions that allow us to make those kind of pivots or perseverance towards uh, uh, throughout our campaigns and how it's uh, a bit tricky to somehow 
and get hold of it real time, etc., in order to be able to do that. So let's, if it's all right with you, just have a, a bit of a discussion around that area because that was a, a very key milestone. Uh, it started with you um, in the previous conversation, Deb. Can you just give us a flavor of um, what you consider to be the barriers here? Because obviously that is a, a barrier towards justifying digital generally, unless we can we can sort it out. Absolutely. So I think, you know, whether it's a barrier or a critical need, um, however you want to frame it, uh, it first starts with the data. And so you have to be able to have data um, that is coming in and, as you said, more real time. We've made a conscious choice at Lilly to own and take back in-house all of our own data. So um, when we started this journey about two, two and a half years ago, our data was spread out across multiple different partners and vendors and, and business partners, and we decided to bring in-house and build our own data environment that um, would give us a 360 view of the customer and understand where they're engaging uh, with us. And so to do that, though, we wanted to bring in the data at the HCP level. We wanted it to be timely, and we had to set up the right data architecture and the format that the data comes back in so that we can adjudicate it and then be able to use it. And it's everything for us, we believe, starts with the data and ends with the data, and then there's a lot that happens in between. And that data will allow you then exactly what you said, Paul, to be able to make better decisions and to be able to adjust a campaign midstream we look at this data right now we're doing it on about a monthly basis we're trying to shorten that to on a weekly basis and even shorter than that as we move forward but what we do with that data then is we're looking at how are where are our customers engaging with us and what content are they engaging with us and we're able to pull all that together and amass and determine um, with through a b testing and different things maybe our date maybe our content isn't very good to to Paul's point earlier, you know, it starts with that content. And so do we need to change the content? Or maybe the channel that we thought what our, our customers had an affinity to, they're not engaging any further. Um, or maybe like what Sarah said, um, they're engaging higher because we're sending that same information through an email that is sent by the rep. And we see open rates much higher there than we do through our emails that we send as a, as a company. So all of that, um, pulled together allows you to, as you said, Paul, be more nimble and agile, which is uh, more real-time making adjustments with a campaign. And Deb, it's, it's the other ball here. Just to, to comment on that, I think that's that's absolutely critical. It would have been interesting, though I'm not quite sure whether your um, research server, Alexandra, uh, would pick it up, is you looked at the total spend um, during that period of time in the first year be interesting to see whether the companies or those top selling products actually modulated, adjusted their, their channel mixes during that time or whether they fixed on their channels at the beginning and stayed with those in the same volume all the way through to the end. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think that's the sort of um, what we tried to address a little bit in terms of looking at the profile of, of the activity. Um, in terms of really modulating on a real-time basis, I'm not sure we have the granularity to do that, but definitely that is something that uh, we would argue is important and needs to start happening um, a lot more. Yeah, so, um, so in, the, in, the, in the study, um, we saw this distinction between those launches which were having this first quarter burst of digital activity and then dialed digital right down versus the ones that were um, more sustained. So that was the level at which we um, looked at it um, in the thought leadership. And um, as we um, found, the uh, more commercially successful launches had a more sustained approach um, to digital. Um, the question of modulation, of course, is uh, much more complex um, than that. Um, and detail. But at that very top level, you can see there's a distinct difference between the most successful launches and how they use digital um, and the less successful launches and how they used um, digital. And, and looking at your slides, uh, so and Alex, I'm interested in slide three that shows um, actually a, a change in the shape of the curve between quarters three and four for both the um, international top sellers and all others. Sort of 
digital spend as a percentage going down to quarter three, then then rising again to quarter four. Any any comments on that? Why that might be? So this one is one that we're still looking um, into, but I think that it might partly be explained by the fact that those two lines um, do have a um, blend of um, launches for which there was this um, first quarter burst. And you can see that um, um, digital share starts high for both the um, successful and the non-successful launches, um, and then the more sustained um, digital um, activity um, products. So it may be that what we're seeing here um, is um, that um, for the um, launches in both camps that were first quarter first and then dialed right back on the um, digital activity um, launches, those drop out of the picture by Q4 and then the, it's the more sustained digital share um, launches that are holding up the, um, um, the fourth quarter um, spend. Um, but um, it probably bears um, further analysis and indeed um, a good question as you pointed out is well what happens in year two? Year one is um, a key year for launch, the um, first six months is crucial for launches um, but the launch is not over for most launches at the end of year one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you can see that uh, whilst you've been uh, discussing this point, I've launched a new uh, question just because we haven't got a huge amount of time left, left, so overlapping a little bit here. And I think I've got about a third of you who've already voted, so thank you for that. But for those who haven't, um, let's, let's, let's see what we've got here because it's obviously uh, relevant to the current conversation. If you had customer data coming back to you in real time, i.e. as quickly as you could possibly wish for, how often would you actually or could you actually adjust your campaign accordingly? So Deb's Deb talked about how uh, she uh, aims, she's aiming towards more frequently than, than the current uh, one, once per month uh, type, uh, type situation. Um, and that's obviously the, the very top option there. Um, so how many of you would actually make that kind of adjustment if you, if you thought you had the data? Uh, and then obviously going to longer periods as we move down that, uh, that picture. So I can see now we've got more than 50% of the, the vote. So I'll hold that open for just a few more seconds, everyone. So five, four, three, two, one. Thank you so much, everybody, and let's have a look at the results. Uh, okay, so um, in the middle, it's a bit of a normal distribution, perhaps no surprise there, up to nearly 40% of people saying perhaps every one to three months, but that would be very slow in any other industry, I have to have to say, as an initial reaction, um, certainly in, uh, in, in industries which are, are, have born, been born in a more digital way, um, it's, it's far more frequent. It would, it would be the majority of people choosing the top option there. Uh, and indeed, uh, that's, that's what we, we can do in many cases now. Um, do you think that um, this is an issue or do you think that this is heading in the right direction as well? Happy to have anyone from the panel comment on this. I think it's um, moving in the right direction. I think that um, we have a couple rate limiters that we have to deal with. And so I think there's the what would you, what do you have the data that informs you to make that decision and are you, how confident are you in the data? But I think there's also the execution challenges that we have to be able to be that quick in response. And, you know, one of them that I'd bring up is um, content. Do we have enough content and can we approve content fast enough within our regulated industry and our processes by which to pivot and respond to the data that tells us that this content isn't working, try something else, or this is working and give them more. I'll, I'll tell you, for example, in a recent, uh, another recent launch that we had a different one, um, we triggered an automated the channels so that as a customer consumed our content and our channels, it would just trigger the next one based on business rules that we had set in place. And we had over 100 customers who consumed all of the content that we had in two weeks. And we had set it up in a normal fashion, we would have set that up to happen once a month. And they consumed it all within two weeks. And we were scrambling to create enough content that would be continue that engagement with those particular customers and move forward. That's a reality. So when you, it's a blessing and a curse to have the data that helps you understand what's going on. The question is how realistic is it that you can respond fast enough and get things back into market um, to continue that engagement or to respond to the engagement that you're getting. 
So I think that reality is, um, while I, I'm optimistic we're going to move to faster than monthly, we've got other barriers we need to address before that becomes a reality. Thank you. Yeah, I um, agree with that, that, Deborah. I mean, the other point to, to consider is the, the volume of content or the size of the content we traditionally have always produced, big website content, um, large uh, iPad details and so on. And be interesting to, to look at how do we be more agile by putting out their smaller pieces of content that we'll be able to turn around much more quickly than rather than trying to produce and get through the approval system big slugs of content. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm aware that we've hardly got any time left and I want to just bring it back to this issue of um, sustain, sustaining ourselves um, beyond the, uh, the initial uh, launch, which was a major feature of the, of the white paper and something we talked about a lot uh, prior to the session. Uh, once again, I've got a, I'll make this the last audience question. Uh, we've got uh, uh, a question for you. What is the biggest factor in how well you can sustain promotional spend post-launch? Just as a reminder, the uh, IQV research uh, showed that this was a, a significant factor in, in the success um, of uh, launch products. So um, what is actually um, helping you or not helping you do that? Um, so let's uh, hold this open for a few seconds. We've got uh, how big the launch was and therefore perhaps how much uh, budget remains. It depends on where customers are on the adoption ladder. Uh, depends on initial launch results or competitor response to, uh, to your launch, um, which obviously is key. Um, depends on how well it was actually planned from the outset and therefore how uh, rigid, I guess, it, it has been. Uh, and then finally, does it, it spends on the, the smart use of more inexpensive digital tools. And we actually ended up, maybe we can talk about it just while we wait for people to vote. Um, we actually talked about uh, how uh, promotional spend is one thing, but of course the level of engagement as a result of that spend is potentially another thing altogether. Uh, and you know, what is the, the biggest driver of that? So perhaps um, Sarah or Alexandra, you could comment on, on what you found was actually, in terms of uh, moving the needle, the, the biggest thing there while we wait for these results to come in. So I think that um, in terms of um, how companies um, sustain promotion um, after um, launch, um, there um, undoubtedly um, is a difference between the um, absolute size of promotional spend between primary care products and specialty products, as we um, talked about um, previously. You know, in the um, promotional activities that we measure. Um, and let's be clear, it's um, not all promotional activity, um, it's a um, subset, but it's the majority of promotional activity. Um, specialty launches um, are tending to spend less, they have to reach fewer um, doctors. However, there is, of course, a substantial level of strictly non-promotional activity in terms of uh, medical science liaison and other activities which inevitably accompany um, strong um, specialty um, launches because of their um, complexity um, and so on and so forth. Um, so spend is a trigger, but um, it's, um, it's, it, it can vary by the type of, um, of, of launch in that respect. Um, I don't know, Alexi, if there's any other points that you want to make. Um, yeah, just that we, we tend to focus a lot on volume of engagement more more than spend when we look at these things because we do find that ultimately that is what companies are after and what they're driving to achieve so probably a better um, measure really of, of that engagement rather than just overall spend. Mm. Okay, maybe easier to measure overall spend. Well, let's have a quick look at the results. So we've only got a, a few seconds left before we have to finish, unfortunately. So as you can see, uh, it's uh, uh, very much down on uh, where customers are. I think you might uh, agree with us there, Deborah and Paul, on, on what's come out most strongly. Um, any final word from you quickly before we wrap up? Um, the only comment I would make is um, data helps. And so one of the things we've moved to at Lilly is predictive analytics and contemplating marginal ROI. And once you prove that the digital is working and that's where your customers are engaging and gaining benefit, 
um, that will help, uh, that has helped us find a way to sustain the investment in the space. Yeah, and it helps sustain the internal resources for it as well, showing that the efforts are making delivering results, I agree. Yep. Yeah. And I would Thank just you. say, um, you know, that the point on um, competitors are well taken, you know, um, it is still the case that if you are in a competitive environment, you have to make sure that um, your voice and the story of your product um, is heard. Um, that's absolutely um, key. And these days, very many products, particularly if they are specialty, are multi-indicational. So a um, first launch is by no means the last launch. And as the um, products news with um, new indications and, um, and, and, and additions to the label comes through, um, clearly this needs to be um, supported um, with um, sustained promotional um, activities. Okay, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Thank you so much to everybody. Uh, once again, there's the contact details for Sarah and Alexandra if the conversation today has uh, led you to uh, have more questions than answers and uh, need to follow up there with, uh, with either of those two. They'd be very willing to help out and to share some more details about the study they've done. Trust me, it's a very interesting one, so definitely uh, make sure you get hold of that. Um, and uh, yeah, really huge thanks to all of our panel. Really appreciate it. If you want to continue the conversation, there's a couple of opportunities to do so face to face, as you can see on your screen right here in Barcelona or Philadelphia. Um, both of these events are way ahead of uh, where they were in previous years in terms of uh, attendance already. So we're going to have a very good crowd at both of those events and would love to have you join if you're not already. And of course, as a thank you for even making it this far, we'll give you a little bit of a discount as well on attending. So make sure you put in that uh, code there, Webinar 200, if you want to come along to that. But the key final message for you is uh, to say, uh, one, is one of thanks to uh, our uh, wonderful panelists today, I thought you were very uh, very keen to share your uh, ideas and energy with us, and I really appreciate that. Uh, and hopefully you can uh, follow up with some of those people at these meetings as well. Um, there are a few questions that we couldn't get to. I apologize for that. Um, but uh, as I say, you can reach out and uh, hopefully get those answered uh, yourself. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you once again to IQV for helping us make sure today happened and for, for making sure that we had a great audience as well. Uh, and thank you to all of you who listened in and gave your answers so willingly, came up with some very interesting data there. So thank you for that. I shall wish the rest of you a wonderful day. And no doubt we will see you sometime very soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, and if you've got any final comments, uh, any suggestions for the future, just um, pop them in on the questions box before you leave. Thank you very much, everyone. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.